Good afternoon. My name is Mohammad Sayyar. I'm with Agile Asset for three years. Um, today's presentation is supposed to be only on inspection uh, side of asset in structure management system, but we decided to cover a bigger picture of the structure management system. So I'll cover the first part of the presentation on uh, asset inspection, and then Steve talk about other components of structure management system. So here is the, what we review and what uh, we see in this presentation, inventory management, inspection, needs modeling, asset trade-off, and uh, system of engagement. Here is uh, the hierarchy of uh, structures uh, we have in New York system. You see that we have two types of structure category, primary assets and secondary assets. Um, we know this, uh, maybe you know a uh, bridge inspector module to uh, inspect only bridge structures, but we are utilizing this module and expand it to other structure types. So under primary assets, we have bridge, large culvert, and overhead sign structures, and under secondary assets, we are retaining walls and noise barriers. We have different workflow for to manage um, each category of assets and uh, structures. For primary assets, we have inventory, inspection, needs modeling, asset trade-off, and work plans. But uh, the secondary assets uh, has uh, more uh, um, simplified process. That we have another session S25, I think, that Amir will present the more details about secondary assets and how they are handled inside Agile. And for a structure asset uh, management, there are five components of Agile Suite uh, uh, be utilized in structure asset management, system foundation, mobile device application, bridge analyst, maintenance manager, and bridge inspector, and on top of these, uh, the structure asset management will be used in uh, Agile Asset Trade-Off Analyst. Here is a workflow for a structure inspector. The, inspe the structure inspector starts with inventory management, inspection scheduling if needed, then inspection and then reporting. And for each part of that, we have um, specific business process and business rules uh, for each asset, for each structure, and for each step of management. Inventory management, this is a place that uh, we collect inventory data, uh, and um, it can be different form for each structure, but uh, for primary assets, we have active edit QC and QA uh, stage, and for secondary assets, we have active edit and QC. So we have one level of review for secondary assets, but two level of reviews for um, primary assets. Another difference between primary assets and secondary assets here is, in primary assets, we have a stage editing functionality, which means that when you start editing one active record, you don't see, uh, I mean, other people cannot see the modified uh, data unless QC and QA process are complete. But in secondary assets, we don't have that functionality. Inspection management. Uh, inspection management, uh, we have a scheduling, inspection, QC, and QA process for primary assets, but we don't need uh, scheduling for secondary assets, and only one level of uh, review, which is QC for secondary assets. Uh, for each level of uh, process, inspect, QC, or QA, we have different uh, business rules for each asset, for each structure, and it can be defined uh, by user, or uh, the system can be configured to address those needs at a structure level. And here are some functionalities 
In inspection process, you see that inspection scheduling is automatic for primary access, but for secondary access is on demand. Element inspection is required for both. Flag management that Steve will talk about uh, are supported in primary access, but we don't need it for secondary access. Work request is only for overhead sign structure management. So you see that some of the functionalities can be specific to one structure type. Even though all structure types are handled within one module, but each structure type can have uh, different uh, functionalities. And both primary and secondary assets support disconnected uh, field, uh, field, data uh, field data collection, sorry. And both uh, support attachment and data quality check available for both and at three levels, data entry before saving data and error report. Data entry means that, for example, if one field, the maximum length is five digits, the, the user cannot enter six digits or four digits in that. Or before saving data, uh, error checking means that, um, for example, if field A is one value, then uh, another field should be filled out or should be null. So basically that's a cross-field error checking. And the challenging part for inspection process is, uh, was the element level inspection that we implemented for all assets, primary and secondary assets. For example, for bridges, the element level inspection support a national bridge element, bridge management element, and agency development element. And they are implemented since April 2016, and NISDOT is using that. And for all elements, quantity defect, and condition state, we have uh, data entry validation. And you see that this hierarchy, the challenging part uh, for New York is they do span by span inspection. So for one bridge, you may have multiple span, and at each span, you have multiple elements. Uh, and for each element at the element level, uh, the user can define defects, photos, and notes, and they are required by some business rules. For example, if you have a very bad condition for one element, the user uh, has to attach a photo and notes to justify that rating. And you see that, I am not sure if you can read that screenshot, but that's a hierarchy of elements, and Another uh, difficulties or complexity for bridge elements is relationship between child and parent element that the system can handle uh, this relationship between child and parent elements. And inspection reports, the system can uh, provide both NBI and NB submittal file. NBI and NB maybe are known as federal tapes and I think this year, New York submitted both NBI and NB files using Agile Assets. Tabular GIS and ad hoc reports are generated uh, for each structure, and customized inspection report is based on a structure type, inspection type, uh, and the status of that structure. The system generates a specific report, inspection, or flag report, or uh, any defined customized inspection report automatically and attached to that uh, structure. So it's a brief overview of inspection process and Steve can talk more about other components of that. Thank you. Michael. I'm Steve Wilcox. Um, I oversee a lot of asset management at, at DOT, which makes me a generalist. I don't know if you know the difference between a generalist and a specialist. A specialist learns more and more about um, less, or less and le he knows more and more about less and less until he knows uh, everything about nothing. Um, and I think that's kind of where I'm where I'm at right now. Um, the uh, I, I first want to thank I want to thank Mohammed. I want to thank Abishak. 
Um, I'd like to thank the folks back at DOT, our ITS folks, um, our Agile team there, um, and in particular, the Structures folks um, back in New York. Uh, it's, it's taken a long time, required a lot of patience to get here, but we've made a, a, a long strides in a very complex process. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all of them. Um, start off, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, bridge data is part of our overall enterprise system. Um, we're doing uh, an implementation that started with BDIS, um, our bridge data system, but then went to the second phase of that project is, uh, includes pavement management, structures management, asset trade-off analysis. Somewhere along the way, we also got right-of-way management in there. We're now just beginning to do maintenance management and we're looking at also doing the replacement of our roadway inventory system. So we've, um, we've got uh, quite an extensive uh, implementation. We're also looking at a SOE, structure, uh, system of engagement. So we're looking at truly trying to create an enterprise system. Um, from a, the bridge data perspective, um, there's this long list of things that you see here that is included in this. I think we retired, I don't know if it's 14 or 18 applications to build all of this into one overall bridge data information system. That includes inventory and inspection. Inspection scheduling, which includes both uh, state forces bridge inspectors and consultant inspectors. Um, load rating, we do three levels of load rating. Vulnerability analysis, that's hydraulic vulnerability, fracture critical vulnerabilities, seismic vulnerabilities, all of those kind of things. Um, flagging, I'll talk a little bit about flagging in a, in a couple minutes. The federal reporting, as Mohammed mentioned, the, uh, we, we sent the federal tape in um, this year using uh, NBE. We actually had two phase implementation. We implemented uh, BDIS with New York elements in 2015. And being gluttons for punishment, we decided to do another go live in 2016 with, uh, with uh, the national bridge elements. Um, we uh, have a field data collection capability, which I'm gonna get into. And we manage web content separately, um, sketches, photos, those kind of things that take up a lot of bandwidth. We manage those uh, separately to, to, to help with the transit, uh, transaction speeds. Linear referencing, an important part of when you're building a, a, a big asset management system with all these secondary assets, pavements, bridges, uh, we want everything to be accessible through a map. Um, that is, as we update the linear referencing system, uh, all the asset related data, all that location data will automatically be updated, will be synchronized um, through the Esri Roads and Highways uh, application. Um, so all the assets will be located on one common LRS, so everything sits on roads and highways. And this is particularly important as we've just begun to scratch the surface of system of engagement. Um, for system of engagement, every, if you have everything on the LRS, I mean, what is the common thing? We're, we're road people, um, we like maps, we should like maps. The common thing is location. You wanna look at a corridor, you wanna look at a county, you wanna look at a region to be able to put all of those assets um, on that map and then be able to drill into the tabular data behind it, it all needs to be on that common uh, LRS and they, uh, to be able to do that. The field data uh, collection solution, we wanna be able to send uh, bridge inspectors out into the field with a laptop to be able to actually collect that data in the field. Um, so they're doing it on, la on a laptop in offline mode so they don't have to be connected uh, we're finding that the, uh, the transaction speeds are faster on the, the uh, offline mode than on the online mode uh, through FDC. Bridge inspectors go and they, they download uh, typically a week's worth of bridges that they're gonna inspect. Um, so that could be a handful of bridges. And as they complete their inspections, they upload them one at a time. Uh, we uh, are also looking at uh, Esri Collector, we heard from uh, Esri earlier, um, for secondary assets. And we're really separating our secondary assets into 
Um, more complex sec secondary assets, which we are put in our structures management module. Those include like uh, overhead sign structures, retaining walls, noise walls. But we're also looking at a mobile solution using Esri Collector for simple se uh, secondary assets like guide rail, pavement markings, um, uh, small culverts, uh, those, ki those kind of things. Uh, structures flags, uh, most of you are probably familiar with flagging. We have red, yellow, and safety flags. They really denote the urgency uh, of, of the defect that needs to be addressed. We also have what we call prompt intermediate action, which tells our folks that there's a defect there that really has to be addressed in a very short time frame. Uh, we have had 47% uh, of the bridges in New York State were built during the interstate era, 55 to 75. Design life of 50 years. Um, we are well beyond the design life of those bridges. What we've seen is a dramatic growth in the number of flags. The need for corrective repairs on bridges has gone up uh, significantly. We're at the point where the, the replacement need is not quite as great, but the need to, we can't just be in a preservation mode or a preventive maintenance mode. In the 80s and early 90s, we had a five to seven program that focused on bridges that were in good condition, keeping them in good condition. We've gotten beyond that point. We're not just changing the oil in the car anymore. We are re replacing the exhaust system, the transmission, those kind of things, still uh, at the uh, kind of the component level. Um, but as these defects grow, and they've grown substantially over the past few years, uh, We've, we have email notifications so that our bridge maintenance engineers and our, our structures management engineers know that the defect is there and know they need to address it. It is uh, tracked both in BDIS and MMS, and that starts to get at some of the systems integration. When you're starting to put all your maintenance data and your bridge data, pavement data all in one system, it's easy to share that kind of information um, across functional areas. Bridge needs modeling. <laughs> By the way, that is my daughter dressed as the Mona Lisa as the asset management director. Um, it's a shout out to Eve. Um, needs modeling. We wanna be able to answer some very fundamental questions. Uh, if we wanna set certain goals, maintain current conditions, hit, hit a, a state of good repair, comply with uh, the, the, the requirements of the, uh, the, the new performance measures in the NPRM. You know, what is the minimum amount we have to spend to be able to achieve those goals? Um, also, what is, so that is unconstrained analysis, or that's unconstrained analysis. Yeah. The, uh, what is the maximum performance we can get for a given dollar amount? So we're constrained by by money, and what we've done, like with our TAMP, we're a pilot state for the TAMP, we're one of three pilot states, and you have to set targets for condition, and our targets are based on what is the optimal uh, bridge system condition that we can achieve for the dollars that we're given. So we use that kind of constrained analysis to determine uh, what that is, and we also do uh, needs-based allocations. We don't allocate funds on, on deck area or anything like that. We look at um, candidates for maintenance and we allocate based on uh, what kind of uh, candidates you have for preservation. And then we compete on a statewide level for, uh, for the major capital work. So it is really needs, needs based with it and it also done in a way that encourages maintenance. Structures analyst, in the simplest term, uh, it's the simplest sense, we're taking inventory and inspection data, running it through an engine, and spitting out a maintenance and capital work plan. The, uh, the needs model in includes uh, deterioration. We have worked with the uh, City University of New York, taking 20 or 30 years of bridge inspection data to look at the, vari the various elements of, the, of our bridges in New York State and determine how they deteriorate over time. So we have empirical models. They are not 
regionally based or you know, in, they, they don't take into account particular environments, but they are more generalized uh, deterioration models by element. Uh, we have treatment and improvement models and decision trees, which are, are uh, we call our legacy rules. They were handed down by the ancients at, at some point, and we don't really know where they came from, but they tell us, you know, a bridge in a certain condition state should have a minor rehab or uh, vertical down or some kind of treatment. That's in the simplest sense, the, you know, we have uh, treatments, decision trees, uh, uh, inventory and condition coming in on one end. We have our deterioration models, uh, our treatment improvement models. So the, the element will, is in a current condition. It will deteriorate over time um, based on where it is in that, on that deterioration curve. It'll determine what the treatment should be. And that given treatment will tell you how far back up the deterioration curve you're going to be after performing that treatment. The decision trees that, that uh, we use look at essentially are you, you know, is, is the defect on the bridge just at the element level where you can just do an element level repair or maintenance. If that's all you need, that is what you program. But if you start to look at a combination of deteriorated elements, if they're still on a superstructure, if they're on the deck, they're on the superstructure, you might um, need to do vertical down. Typical pathology of, of bridge, bridge deterioration, you get chlorides through the joint, all joints leak. Um, you get section loss at the girder ends. You get uh, pack rust in the bearings. If the bearings freeze, you can get cracking in the columns. So that is really how a bridge deteriorates. So we might do what we call a vertical down treatment, where we try to, to treat everything in that vertical line, um, which is the typical pathology of that deterioration. Um, more complex stuff, we might do a minor a deck replacement, a minor rehab, or if you get into the substructure, if the substructure is bad and you have to replace that, you got to replace everything. So we, we apply those rules to determine what we should do. Here's an example of uh, element level deterioration curves for a, uh, a bridge deck. That's a screen from the system. What you'll see is uh, by doing a, a general rehab, it takes all of these elements that are shown up there and resets them to uh, a, a new condition state. So there's a fair amount of complexity in looking at the, the outcomes that come from a, a treatment strategy. And in the end, what we do in New York is we uh, every, we talk about uh, deficient bridges, which is that line in the middle. But what we really do is we do the leaky bucket kind of management of bridges. You get a tenfold increase in cost every time you go from one higher condition state to another. A, uh, a preventive maintenance treatment on a bridge will cost five to ten thousand dollars on average. A uh, uh, corrective repairs on bridges, a quarter million to a half a million. Bridge replacement, five to six million. So. If you're not going to sub-optimize your system, to optimize your system, you need to, to treat as much of the system as you can at the lowest cost possible. So that is our overall strategy. So we're trying to keep stuff in the green and yellow from falling into the, uh, the orange and the red categories. That's essentially our, our management strategy. Asset trade-off analysis. Why am, I, why am I, it's now called portfolio analyst. I got that right. Um, I'm bringing it up because uh, when we talk about portfolio, portfolio analysts or asset trade-off, what the asset trade-off or portfolio analyst is really doing is taking a program of projects that is already optimized. So these things that's optimized in the bridge analyst, in the bridge management system, and we bring those optimized pavement programs and bridge programs for a given dollar amount and then do trade-off to say, how big a pavement program should we have versus how big a, a bridge program should we have? Um, and similar, we actually have very similar management objectives for bridges and pavements. Again, we're, we're doing that, that leaky bucket, trying to keep things in the better condition states. What we do with pavements is we do that on a dollar per VMT basis. So rather than just looking at an individual structure, we're trying to get the lowest cost where the traffic is the highest. 
but they're, they're parallel, and the advantage of the fact that they're parallel and we're trying to manage the leaky bucket and backlog, which we use as, as a proxy for maintenance, what is the dollar value of all the, the work that isn't done, that needs to be done, um, we, we, we look at all of that and we create utility functions. We brought uh, Decision Lens in to do you know, some Boolean analysis where you say, what's more important, a bad pavement or a bad bridge, uh, bridge deck? You know, who thinks that's more important? We end up developing utility functions to do cross-asset uh, trade-offs. Uh, and an interesting outcome of that, and this is only at the theoretical level, this is the first time we've done this, I just want to get this out there for folks to think about, um, because I'm not, we're, we're certainly not convinced at NYSDOT nice that this is the case, but it's a, a very interesting thought experiment, because when you run this, all the structures people, the pavement people, the planning people agree on the utility functions. Um, at the end of the day, when you run the asset trade-off, it says you should spend a lot more money up front on pavements than you do on bridges. Traditionally, we have put the bulk of our program into bridges because bridges fall down. No one wants a bridge to fall down. That's awful. But we also have bridge safety assurance programs to, to prevent that from happening. What happens is when you start to do this analysis, where you're triggering those points, where you're going from preservation to corrective repairs to renewal type of work, where those costs start going up, bridges deteriorate much more slowly than a pavement does. Pavements deteriorate very quickly. Because they deteriorate very quickly, you hit those points um, where you're triggering the next highest cost action. So what we're seeing is from an economic, purely economic standpoint, that it may be valuable to go and uh, invest the, your first dollar in the pavement before you invest in bridges, particularly in terms of when you're in an austerity period. Asset trade-off, um, what you get from uh, asset trade-off analysis is you get what is called this frontier performance. You're looking for given budgeted amount uh, for pavements and bridges. You create a super scenario and that will tell you where on this curve um, that scenario ends up. What you find is some scenarios, you see the one with the little arrow on it, shows that you can actually get better performance for a lower cost when you bring a certain combination of optimized pavement and bridge scenarios together, um, determining you know, that, that at that level you can actually pr provide a better level of service than a different scenario where the pavement bridge balance may be different at a, at a higher dollar value. In summary, the uh, structures management system, we We've already implemented the inspector. We uh, are in the process of implementing structures analyst. That goes live uh, next year, along with pavement analysts. And in two years, we'll have maintenance management. And at that point, we'll be able to go and, and do asset trade-off with the, uh, the portfolio analyst. And the last thing, kind of the holy grail, um, is we... Uh, 10, 12 years ago, I was project manager to implement our maintenance management system. As I got to the end of that, I, I, I always joke with people that the first half of an IT project is figuring out how to get the data in, and the second half of an IT project is figuring out how to get the data out when you have these really complex systems um, and where only some people actually have access to because of their security rights and so on. We tend to think about how we're going to collect all this data, but we don't think as much, besides reporting, about how we're actually going to use this data. Uh, we, uh, I ran into Stan Burns from uh, Utah DOT at a, at a conference in upstate New York. They've done a great job with uh, UPlan. We also saw some, some stuff on, on Idaho's iPlan on how to actually take all of this uh, asset data across assets, across locations, and how do, we, how do we extract that? How do we make this information easy to extract so that if you're a planner or a, a bridge engineer or uh, a maintenance engineer in the field, how do you easily get at this without having to have expertise in a particular stovepipe? 
And what, what Stan had done that I, I thought was really impressive is the, the ability to go and, and, uh, and use GIS, because what's common is, is location, and be able to look at a map. And basically, you've got a bunch of map layers. And he says, tell me, show me all the guide rail. Uh, show me all the guide rail that's in poor condition, all the guide rail that's in poor and fair condition. Put all that up on a map. You can look at it in terms of a corridor. You can say, what's the pavement? You've got accidents. What's the pavement friction? What's the average running speed? What's the timing of the signals? When you're bringing all this information into an enterprise system, uh, you have that ability to go and pull all of that information together in a way that is very, uh, very visible, very visual. Um, and they've actually gotten to the point, because they bring their, uh, their pay items in, where they can go and look at a corridor and design a simple uh, vendor in place paving project where they can go and they can say, here's the pavement condition, so I've got to do this kind of, of treatment. Uh, we have safe tap stuff, we've got bad guide rail. Um, if, there, if there's a bridge, you, know, you can look at that bridge condition and you can start managing things by corridors across assets. Because really, now what we typically do is pavements and bridges pretty much define. You've got a bridge program, you've got a pavement program, and the pavement condition or the bridge condition alone determine what the project is. This allows us to bring other asset conditions in and uh, actually be able to go and, and do some, some simple designs. He has a 15 minute vendor in place pavement design you can do when you've captured all of this information. Uh, we're also looking at using LIDAR. They do, they, that's what they use in, in Utah. And with LIDAR, now you've got point clouds and you can actually do measurements. So when you bring this information in, you can drill in through the map, you can look at your photo log, so you can see what the condition is uh, on, that, on, the, on the, the photo. You can then use, you know, the new metric folks are here, they've developed the ability to go and do, you can do measurements, you can measure the pavement width, um, you can do some analysis of, of what's there. So it's a great way to be able to really dr drill into the data you're a maintenance engineer, somebody calls in, there's a problem on a section of highway, you don't have to drive for an hour to go see what's going on out there. You, get, you, have, uh, you can take a visual look at what's going on. Um, you can determine, you can drill into that tabular data to see you know, where is the culvert, what is the culvert condition, is the culvert clogged, um, what's the condition of, a, you know, if it's a large culvert, is it structurally deficient. You can get into all of that kind of uh, data and very easily uh, assess what the need is and send a crew out there without having to do a, a lot of reconnaissance to be able to do that. So we see that as the future. Um, a, a, an advantage of having an enterprise solution is uh, what Stan had to do was build kind of an elaborate data warehouse because he's pulling from a whole bunch of sources. Our data is all in, in one enterprise solution. So hopefully that will make building this um, a lot easier for us. So that is kind of the future, that we're, we've got Esri and Agile coming in together uh, as, as a partnership in a couple of weeks to talk about uh, SOE. And with that, uh, we can entertain any questions you guys have. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve and Mohammed. Um, you know, this is, thanks for a very clear explanation, by the way, of a complex system. Uh, you know, this is a time of transition, especially in the bridge community. You have the changes in the, what the feds are requiring us to report and how bridges are reported. And also, you have this tsunami of bridges that were all built in a certain time period in our country's history. And, they're getting older and older, and many times you might have 60% of your bridges or, or even 70% of your bridges that are pretty much about to be past their design life. And that's going to create some really tough challenges on, on funding and, and how, you, uh, how you attack that. And systems like this you know, can help with that. So um, thank you very much. If there are any questions, we'll take them right now. Thank you. Um, in the, the change from the 
the original New York elements to the National Bridge elements, the NBE, was that something that, that New York felt was the right technical move? Your bridge engineers, did they like the going down to an element level and, and the, new, the new rating levels that they had to do? Uh, do, you, do you want to Yeah, actually, the NBE element, the new element level inspection requirement is introduced in 2013. So they have to follow that new requirement. And, but it's more complicated than what New York used to use, used to collect data. It was, um, they were collecting uh, and rating elements for, um, at element level, but they rated based on NBI rating, which means that it was just quality based. They had one rating per element, but in new system, they have to specify uh, how much of that element is in condition state one, two, three, four. So it's kind of rating in quantitatively. So it's more complicated than that than what they had before. Uh, and the answer, I think, is, is mandated by FEDS, so yes. they have to follow that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it is mandated by FEDS, so we had to do it. Uh, I always talk about government employees. There, there's two things government employees hate. One, the way things are, and two, change. Um, <laughs> so there's, there, there's always the challenge of, uh, of changing to a new system. I'm a maintenance guy. Our bridge maintenance folks like this a lot because now you're getting down to, to what is the defect, what's the extent of the defect. Uh, that kind of information is much more useful to a bridge maintenance engineer than what we traditionally uh, uh, captured. Hey, Steve, what was your process in um, redefining your element language to fit into the new format? Did, did you rely on somebody else to do that, or did you guys rewrite the language for each element condition yourself to, in order to bring it into that new format from, like, let's say, a five condition state or a bridge or a three into that four condition state format that the feds require now? Um, I think for the legacy data, they didn't merge to that. So they still they have the old element level inspection and we added the new element level inspection on top of that, we call FHWA element inspection. So we didn't. We're actually converting the data back. Oh, okay. Now. So to run the needs model, we are taking the NBE inspection data, converting it back to the, the uh, New York element <laughs> All right. and, and running the models. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with Pascal about that uh, in a meeting that we had yesterday about we need new models to take into account uh, extent of, of quantity and extent of defect in, in, in those legacy rules that I talked about earlier. And uh, our structures folks want to get a feel for, we don't even have a feel for, you know, you, you know that a one translates to a seven in ours, but those, you know, twos and threes, uh, as compared to, to a, you know, a four or five in our system, we really don't know how, in the mind of the inspector, when they go out and see this, exactly how that's going to translate. And because even with this one to seven scale, we're really not managing on the one to seven scale. We are deciding that between a 4.3 and a 4.8, uh, that is, those are corrective repairs. 4.8 to 5.3 is, uh, is preservation and below 4.3 is typically replacement candidates. So how, you know, when you get to that level of precision, um, how that's going to translate, I, we want to get a, a feel for how those inspections come in before we uh, come up with a new needs model. Any other questions? Steve, you mentioned that you use decision trees right now. Are y'all planning on sticking with that in the future, or are you going to move to decision matrices? That's a good. That's a good question. We haven't. Uh, we actually haven't 
talked about that. I personally, I like the decision matrix. Uh, last Agile conference, uh, there's some discussion about the decision matrices. I know Mike Rossi's in the, in the audience here. He's, he wrote our pavement management system. He certainly, I won't speak for you, Mike, but we talked about this. You like the decision matrix, the matrix for pavement management, and I think it makes sense for bridge management. But again, I am the generalist. I know everything about nothing. Um, so that's really up to our structures folks in the long run. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hi, Steve. Um, we are undergoing in, in Minnesota an inspection of our earth retaining walls, our noise walls. I've seen your overhead sign inspection that you guys have done. Um, are you doing element-based ratings for the noise walls, earth retaining walls, or have you done that? And then are you doing distresses on that? I don't know. I, as far as I know, we are not doing the stresses. What I do want to make a point of, I, I failed to mention this, is uh, for all secondary assets, we have decided to go with the NBE scale. Because we, honestly, we really have a whole lot of data already um, on noise walls and retaining walls and overhead sign structures, so we're starting fresh. The idea is what we're trying to do with all secondary assets is get common screen designs, common workflows, um, uh, common definitions, locate things the same way. Because the idea is to have a one mind system so that it looks like one brain designed it so that you don't have to be, you know, oh, in bridges it's a one to seven scale and pavements it's a one to 10 scale. Um, what about because your, all of these things happen kind of. What about your culverts? <laughs> Because ours are different. Our culver we have the we have that problem a little bit where we have different scales for different assets and it's difficult. Yeah, and we're everything is being converted, but okay. uh, the large culverts are in our bridge, bridge management system, and they have been for for a long time. It's small culverts, which we did an inventory and inspect. We're creating a small culvert system, again using the the one to four scale. Uh, for retaining walls, we also, we, 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 what we have in there is we have inventory inspection, but we also have like geom wall type or, and geometry because there are a lot of geometric elements that, co that are associated with retaining walls that you'll want to know. So when we have the common screen design, it's an inventory tab, an inspection tab, a tab for photos and, and sketches, and then for them, we, we've created another tab for geometry. Um, I think tomorrow morning, Amir will be presenting one session on noise barriers and retaining walls. Yep. It's the same place, right? Yeah, same place. Yeah, tickets for that are free. All right, guys, thanks for a very informative session. That was great.